And we are back on the Zero Hour. I am Richard R.J. Escal, and our next guest is a good friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, but please don't hold that against him. He has written a new and extremely compelling book called The Orpheus Clock, The Search for My Family's Art Treasure Stolen by the Nazis. Simon Goodman spent many years in the music business, starting in the glory days of the 1960s in London and going on through much later. For the last 20 years, he has been someone uh, described by many as an art detective as he searches out his family's stolen art treasures and recovers them. And he has now written a book about it, and he joins us. Simon, thanks for coming on the program. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. And now, listen, uh, I, you know, I meant it when I said that this book was uh, extremely compelling. And one of the things that struck me about it, I want to get to to the art history and to the art detection. But one of the things that struck me in reading your book was that there was, in a sense, uh, uh, I felt, uh, and by the way, I remember as a friend, you kind of going through the process of creation, book creation, which is always an, a, an extended gestation period. But um, uh, one of the things that struck me most about it was that it, in many ways, it really did feel like a um, an evolution of your own sense of personal identity. Uh, does that make sense? Does that resonate with you? Very much so, because uh, I grew up in London after the war pretty much in the dark. I had no idea who my family was. We had virtually no relatives. And my father, most of all, didn't speak about anything really other than safe subjects like uh, football or cricket, soccer that is, to your listeners. Um, so sadly, it's not until really when he dies in 1994 and his girlfriend packs up the contents of his desk and all his cupboards and ships them over here to L.A. to me and my brother that we really get the first opportunity to piece together who this man was and what our family history had been, too. So uh, it's it's been a big uh, learning curve for me, a road to discovery through the art, perhaps, uh, by tracing each individual piece, I've been able to gather an insight into those in my family who collected these wonderful pieces and lived with them. So, um, so it's a little own... bit, it, it's a little bit like assembling a mosaic out of these pieces of art to tell your own family's story. It, this is this the way it felt? And um, I, I don't. I got the impression you weren't all that connected, even with the fact that your 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 family escaped the Nazis, that your grandparents did not escape the Nazis, or Jewish identity, all those things. It seemed as if that was very distant from your world growing up, and that this was a journey into it. Is that a fair description? That's true. In fact, my mother. I'm not still not quite sure to this day why had me both christened and confirmed when I was about 13. So I remember getting some nice presents out of that, but that's about it. Um, nobody from my family went to church. Nobody from my family went to synagogue. Um, we clearly lost our faith and... Uh, and the identity that went along with it, right? I mean, or, you know, it's tempting to speculate that maybe they felt there was a certain security in kind of blending into... Uh, the culture that had a, where you were oh, that, that, that's very true I found even amongst um, the these strange documents my father left me uh, was the uh, baptisms or conversion certificate of my grandparents to hmm. the Lutheran Church and I've got a feeling that this was one of the documents they were frantically waving around while they were under house arrest in Holland uh, forced to wear the, the yellow star on all their clothes. Mm -hmm. And uh, inevitably, the, this document, this conversion, didn't make the slightest bit of difference to the Nazis. But, um, yes, yeah, so it's been a road of discovery, the, the, the concept that um, you don't just stop being Jewish overnight is, is probably the moral of this tale, mm -hmm. one of the many morals of this tale. Right, and that people who are determined to hate will find a reason to hate and, and, and hunt out those they hate. Now, we're talking with Simon Goodman, who's author of the book The Orpheus Clock, The Search for 
my family's art treasures stolen by the Nazis. So let's go to how did you get into uh, hunting down these pieces? Was this after your father died and you saw the papers? Did something in there kind of trigger this curiosity, this search for the missing treasures? Well, that's exactly right. Uh, there were still many letters about what clearly I, I deduced were missing works of art that were still missing, that he had not been able to find. Uh, in, amongst all these many papers and inventories were um, some photos, in fact, three negatives, as I discovered, taken by a wonderful woman in Paris during the war called Rose Vallon, who featured in the Monuments Men movie recently. Mm -hmm. um, she theoretically worked for the Germans during the day, but the resistance at night, and she'd document what she could of uh, what they were about to ship to Germany um, or, or even Switzerland uh, the next day. So I, my brother had these negatives printed, and they were three Impressionist paintings. Two of them I figured out fairly quickly were by uh, Edgar Degas, and uh, the other one was by Renoir. So my brother and I simply said, well, you look for Renoir, I'll look for Degas. <laughs> so we had no idea what would come of this search, if it were even possible. So uh, this was before the Getty Institute was built here in LA, of which I'm now a member, and which is a marvelous resource of uh, information, vast resource. So before that, I would go to UCLA, and I haunted every library I could find, and they ordered every book on Edgar Degas that they didn't even have in stock. So many were sent down to Ber from from Berkeley, excuse me, down here to LA. I mean, they were very helpful and quite pleasant. Eventually, I mean, it took me a while, but eventually, I found an image that matched this wartime negative I had, you know, on my desk right in front of me. And it told me that it had been lent to an exhibition in New York in 1995. Uh, so this is, you know, this is a year after my dad died that all this is taking place. And uh, that it had been loaned by an extremely wealthy man from Chicago. And that started my journey. And, you know, I, it seems, if I may interrupt, we're, uh, we're talking with oh. Simon Goodman, author of The Orpheus Clock. It seems to me that there, there are two sides to this process. One is the discovery of the missing art objects, art objects in this case. And the other is that I, uh, my, my sense in reading the book is that when you started this process some 20 years ago, there was really very little legal precedent for uh, how to recover a stolen, a work of art that had been stolen by the Nazis. It seemed that, you know, you're talking about international law, multiple jurisdictions, history spanning many, many decades and so on. So I think along with the investigation came the legal pursuit as well, right? Well, that's quite right. Um, it turned out that this Degas trial, which we initiated, or the legal process, was the first art looting law case in the United States since the Holocaust era. Um, we had to find uh, skilled lawyers to help us pursue this path. Eventually, partly because I didn't want my dear aunt, who survived the war and is now actually 97 and still uh, uh, alive and strong, we hope. Um, I didn't want her to be the star witness in what would have been a grueling trial. Also, the trial, the legal process in this country is such that the, the, the trial would have cost uh, more than the painting was worth. But mm -hmm. still, we, we achieved a settlement, um, Solomonic, some called it. Hmm. The, the painting uh, hangs in the Art Institute in Chicago with my grandparents' name on the plaque, which is, I believe, that alone is a great victory. Mm -hmm. But also we stirred um, the, the art world considerably and created notice in political circles. Then other families like mine, who'd also lost many um, valuable but uh, recognizable works of art. It's, it's unfortunate, but um, obviously it's almost impossible for um, some poor lady, say, living in New Jersey today, whose family lost a silver cup in Poland in 1940. That's probably never going to be recovered, I'm afraid. Um, my family was lucky, uh, I suppose, to have many very identifiable 
artworks by, for instance, uh, great painters such as Botticelli. So these were easier to find. But, you know, the, the political process was such that people uh, realized this was a big unsolved problem that had been buried since the end of the war. One of the reasons being that uh, all the documents to do with interrogation of art looters conducted by the British and American forces uh, in 1945 and 46 at the end of the war were sealed as state secrets for 50 years. Uh, the French, the West Germans, the Dutch all followed suit. So people have often asked me, why is this happening now? Well, that's one of the big reasons mm -hmm. is all the re pertinent information was buried for half a century. And when it started to emerge, which coincided with uh, my finding this first painting, and then other families came along, uh, the State Department convened what is now known as the, the Washington Conference. They settled on what, what uh, have become the Washington principles that all U.S., all supposedly all U.S. museums have signed on to, at least in principle, which means that they will examine their collections for any artworks that have dubious provenances um, dating during the, the, the Holocaust era. All other countries uh, that were part of the Second World War also, in theory, at least signed on. The, the Dutch government actually created a restitution committee. So did the Austrians. Uh, the French did something similar. So the whole world changed very dramatically um, right at the end of the 90s. And, you know, one of the things that I think people don't realize, we're talking with Simon Goodman, author of The Orpheus Clock, is uh, the extreme... Um, how do I put it? Uh, the Nazis were so evil and yet in some ways so sophisticated uh, and, and cultured, they were extremely systematic about uh, the looting of, of the art, weren't they? And then, then as the uh, Nazi regime began to fall, many of them were, were quite uh, inventive in getting these, hiding these artworks, burying them, getting them out of the country and so on. Yeah. Well, that's right. Um, Switzerland was the r resort, the fence of choice, so to speak, because it was neutral. And uh, that's where most uh, Nazi looted valuables were stored towards the end of the war. I mean, that those that they could get out of the country. The, the Allies did recover a vast amount of treasure troves, uh, for instance, in salt mines in Bavaria and Austria, in some of the famous castles, uh, the Mad Ludwig's Castle had a huge amount of my family's furniture in the basement, along with the French Rothschilds, for instance. So, and most of these were accompanied by very good inventories and documents, which is a big part of my story. My own family's uh, paperwork, documents, files were all destroyed. Uh, during the war by the Germans. Mm -hmm. So all that survived were the Nazi records of what they took. And uh, as you point out, amazingly, they, they were very uh, thorough in their descriptions and documentation. I had to wait 50 years for all this to come up, to become public. And each day, each time I go back, for instance, to the U.S. National Archives, a section called the R. Delia Hall Collection, which deals with World War II looting, um, there's always more about my family. Every time I go back, it, 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 it keeps growing. And I've been able to secure also from German archives, French archives, the Nazi inventories, which is how I am able to do what I do, because I can see exactly, well, not exactly, but in many cases, what they took. Now, and just before we... we uh we part ways, Simon Goodman. In talking about this, uh, I want people to also understand that the book, besides going into great depth about the history of the processes that we're describing now, uh, there are parts of the book that were quite moving, extremely moving, and uh, to me, most of those had to do with the fate of your grandparents who died in Nazi hands, the or, you know the original owners of... Uh, of these works of art and um, 
I guess I would close by saying, uh, did you exp- w- did you have any idea where this journey was going to take you? I mean, in the end, you're 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 going to Europe. You're trying to follow their trail. You have some idea of how they may have died. It's it's devastating to read. Um, did you have any idea where this process was taking you, or did you just kind of uh, let one foot follow the other, and that's where you wound up? Well, you're right there. It was literally one foot in front of another. I didn't realize the extent, uh, the emotional depth uh, of what I would experience, but uh, I'm very pleased I did. It was difficult. It was painful. I bought every memoir that survived from Terzienstadt, the camp where my grandparents were interned for about a year. In the process, as painful as it was, I got closer to them the grandparents I never knew and the family that was taken away from me. So it, it was a, a, a bittersweet experience. Uh, it was worth doing because I, I know who I am. I know where I came from today. And I, rather than sweep under the carpet what might be unpleasant, uh, I have a good grasp of history today. The chapter in The Orpheus Clock about the concentration camp is very accurate and very well documented with dates, names, cell numbers, train numbers, the guards' names even I was able to deduce. So it's it's quite a historic testament, which I'm very proud of. And then since then, we've, we've had some great experiences too, which I didn't expect. Right here in L.A., uh, a wonderful collector, after I tracked down a painting to his home just two miles from here, took me a year of talking to him, but he took it off his wall and uh, helped load it in the back of my old Jag as I <laughs> well, drove off feeling... Very, very, you know, gratified and there's a sense that, you know, this is all really worth it. Um, I didn't know where this uh, journey would lead me, but it's been a a wonderful journey, painful, but uh, beyond worthwhile. And so I I had to share my story. Uh, Well, it's also bittersweet, but it's it's worth it. And, well, it's also led to a wonderful book, which which I was very moved uh, reading, I, and so I encourage people to take a look at it. We've been talking with Simon Goodman. He is the author of The Orpheus Clock, The Search for My Family's Art Treasures Stolen by the Nazis. Simon, thanks so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.